And in the U.S., most people are spinning short fiber. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, people that spin cotton, people that spin polyester, people that spin rayon, um, they're all spinning on, on what's called the short staple system. And it's all based on the length of cotton. And so since cotton is typically about one inch in length, a little bit longer than that, then polyester is usually cut to one and a half inches and so is rayon. And so so those fibers are, are set up on certain machinery that is geared toward handling that length fiber. Now, there's also... Hey guys, it's Mandy with the Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you very, very much for joining. I'm really excited to have you, to have an opportunity to meet so many people. Again, if you like our content and like what we're producing, please like, share, comment, subscribe. You'll meet so many amazing people with all of the interviews that we've done. They're available on our YouTube channel and on Patreon. Welcome, thank you very much for joining me today and welcome everybody else that's tuning in. Really excited to introduce our guest, Jim Budabaugh. Is that how you say, Budabaugh? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually practiced that before. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really excited. You're with National Spinners, right? National Spinning. Spinning, okay. Right. Um, would you mind doing a quick intro? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and what you're up to. Sure. Um, I've been in the, the textile business for um, longer than I'd like to admit. Um, and uh, uh, so over the years, been involved in, in spinning uh, cotton in the first part of my career. And then um, and then for the second part of my career, it's been predominantly wool and synthetic fibers that uh, have been spinning. And um, at National Spinning, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year, which is exciting. And uh, we started out as, as a wool spinner and uh, sort of uh, uh, evolved into a spinner of, of acrylic and then polyester and then rayon and then uh, uh, performance uh, fibers for uh, protection, cut protection and, um, and fire protection. And, and it got to the point where uh, I would say we'd spin everything except cotton at National Spinning. And just as soon as you say that, somebody will ask, well, can't you put just a little bit of cotton in? And so, so yeah, we even spin some yarns with a little bit of cotton now. Um, and so we, we spin uh, just about everything. We also have a subsidiary uh, company that we uh, purchased nine years ago called Carolina Nonwovens. So in addition to being in their traditional you know, spinning industry that feeds into knitting and, and uh, weaving. We also have a non-wovens operation and that operation uh, produces predominantly um, thicker non-wovens that would go into padding. So there'd be, it'd be for foam replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it works well for insulation, works well for construction proje uh, products, it goes into bedding for institutional bedding for, for prisons. And then there are also a ton of automotive applications for the non-woven. So national spinning is, uh, we, we spin the yarns and Carolina non-wovens makes the, the uh, non-woven pads. Very cool. So talk to me a little bit about, I had no interest at all in the textile industry until I got into hemp. I didn't realize that woven versus non-woven or that textiles was anything more than just our clothes, right? Yeah. Tell me a little bit, can you explain to me, like, what does the process look like for a non-woven application? Um, say if we're taking hemp or any of the other synthetic or non-synthetic natural fibers. Okay, okay. so in, in traditional textiles, we're, we're going to, to take fiber and in majority of the time that fiber is to cut is cut in various lengths or lengths or it comes sheared off of wool and, and it's in various lengths. And we'll we'll uh, elongate those fibers and blend those fibers together and get them into uh, an initial strand. And that strand usually ha is fairly thick. It's probably a couple inches thick. And then along the line, we'll we'll continue to stretch that down and get it smaller and smaller. And when it gets to a certain size, it won't hold together anymore unless it has twist in it. So then when, when it gets down to the yarn level, we twist, we pull it out very uh, thin and put twist in it. And then we spin it onto a, um, onto a package and we have a yarn. So then that yarn 
is either put on a knitting machine or put on a weaving machine, maybe braided into a rope mm -hmm. um, and, and then it's produced. And so we have a lot of different steps to, to go from fiber to fabric in a traditional process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be as many as 10 or 12 steps that you have to go through to get it from fiber to fabric. In non-wovens, we, we put the fiber in the back of a machine and and we, we, we blend the fibers together, but then they come out in a big mat. And, and, and then the mat will typically go through either a process called needle punching where needles will come down and entangle the, the, the product mm -hmm. in there. And then it'll be condensed down and, and it'll come in one process. It'll go from fiber to fabric. Mm -hmm. Or as in the case that, that we do, we, we have something that's called thermobonding. And so we we put a fiber in there that will melt and and, it, and we take it through an oven and the fiber part of the fibers melt and disperse among the whole mat. And then it's, it's, it's pressed down. And then when it comes out of the oven, it it hardens. And then you've got a you've got a, a mat with integrity, a, a fabric with integrity, so to speak. It's a, our process is a little bit thicker than, you know, a fabric that would go into apparel. It'd be more like the, 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 like a thick blanket it would be the, the, the thinnest mm -hmm. that we would go all the way up to something that would be uh, a cushion that would be on, like a cushion that was on your, your sofa. I hear that kitty. <laughs> yeah. Rob's, I just hear it? <laughs> Rob's saying hello. That's awesome. Okay. So when we talk industry, like where it's going into automotive is a big topic that we talk a lot about in the hemp industry and the benefits, right? Where do you see consumer demand moving towards a natural fiber compared to rayon or any of the others that you're using? Well, I, I think the real uh, appeal of hemp is going to be in um, some fiberglass replacement opportunities because fiberglass is something that, that people are a little bit squeamish about, right? Yeah. Because if you've ever handled fiberglass insulation, you get all itchy and then you have to wear a mask so you don't breathe it in because it's not good for mm -hmm. your, your, your lungs to breathe in particles of the fiberglass. And, and then, and then if it burns, you know, there, it, it, it'll, 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 there'll be some bad stuff that'll come out. So, so, you know, in places where there's fiberglass, you say, well, could we put hemp in instead of that or, or any other natural fiber, but, mm -hmm. but hemp with some of its natural antibacterial characteristics could work very well in something like house insulation mm -hmm. and housing insulation uses a lot of fiberglass right now, but you know, could, would it be better to have hemp in there and with its antibacterial properties and, and it's not itchy. And if you're, if you're applying it and, you know, it, it's, it's environmentally friendly. So an application there could work well. Fiberglass is used in ceiling tiles, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, a hemp product could be used in, in that. And there are already some natural fibers that are used in that application. Jute is one that's used in that application. In automobiles, there is uh, there's a lot of sound deadening material in automobiles, and um, whether it be underneath your dashboard, whether it be in your door panels, whether it be under your hood, around your tires, there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that are put on the car to keep it quiet when it's on the road, and um, and there's no reason that that hemp couldn't um, be manufactured into a product that that could. Uh, they could replace some of the existing products that, that are in there now. So there are all, kind, all kinds of opportunities in addition to the ones that everybody thinks of first, which, hey, I'd like a hemp shirt or I'd like hemp socks or I'd like a hemp beanie. Well, those are all well and good, but there's a much broader application beyond uh, beyond just that, that first thought of clothing. Oh, totally. Well, and the awareness that hemp has brought in how broken the supply chain is for the textile industry um, has been alarming to me. And I see it as an opportunity to really fix or bring a more sustainable and um, scalable operation to the United States. What's your opinion there in being in the textile industry and, and being a spinner, you know, operating yourself in the United States? Do you think that competitively the U.S. has a chance at, at scaling hemp um, for textiles? Or you know, where are we looking as far as 
the industry in itself and being able to compete. Yeah, I, um, and and of course, on the non-woven side, it's a no-brainer because I, I you know, I I, th I think it's easy to whether you're going into automotive, uh, the supply chain is shorter, and um, and companies like ours know who all the players are in the supply chain. Right. But they're, they, and and so you know, if somebody wanted to put together a hemp product it, it, going into non-woven, because there are fewer steps. And also right. because because the machinery is a little more um, accepting mm -hmm. of variation in fibers, then then that's easy. Now let, now if we flip over to the traditional textile side, and we're talking about uh, the uh, the yarn production to the knitter or the weaver to the to the garment manufacturer, um, that is those supply chains are a little bit trickier because um, the supply chains are generally set up based on the fiber that's going in. So you've got your cotton supply chains and everybody knows who the cotton spinners are. M most everybody knows who knits and weaves uh, cotton fabric and then, and then the garment producers are, are flexible there. And so that's pretty easy. Um, and then on, on polyester, on wool, everybody has sort of, they, they know who's in that groove. Mm -hmm. But since hemp hasn't been around, um, and, and it's not just hemp, there's there's not a lot of uh there's not a lot of flax that's spun in the United States uh anymore. And there's some other fibers that are unusual, uh, even some technical fibers that no one has really spun much of before. So you've got to build the supply chain and you almost have to go out and find each step of the chain. Are you willing to do this? And um yeah, so it is a challenge with hemp. Um, there are only a handful of spinners in the U.S. that would even take on that challenge, and then and then probably there are only a limited number of of knitters that would do it as well because it's going to be different, mm -hmm. and and different is always scary, right? Yes. Right, mm -hmm. and and so so you know it, it'd be wonderful. If, you know, the same way that we spun wool, we could just bring hemp in and we could run it with the same settings on the machinery and everything would be fine and everybody would be happy. But that's not the way it's going to it's going to be. There's going to be uh, a good deal of development and there's going to, uh, you know, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to change our machine settings and communicate with the producers of the fiber. Hey, can you tweak this a little bit? Can you make this, you know, can you do something? So this will be, the fiber will be a little bit longer. Can you do something? So, um, you know, the fiber will have a little bit less dust in it, you know, and, and so we're just going to have to have that communication. And, and as of right now, we just don't know exactly who are the, the experts, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So you were saying earlier, like the long fibers versus short fibers. And in the U S most people are spinning short fiber. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, people that spin cotton, people that spin polyester, people that spin rayon, um, they're all spinning on, on what's called the short staple system. And it's all based on the length of cotton. And so since cotton is typically about one inch in length, a little bit longer than that, then polyester is usually cut to one and a half inches. And so is rayon. And so, so those fibers are, are set up on certain machinery that is geared toward handling that length fiber. Now, mm -hmm. there's also long staple spinning, um, and and uh, that's geared more toward wool. And when the wool, the natural wool comes off of the sheep, and after it's it's uh, cleaned and scoured and combed, then that wool is going to be three and a half to four inches on average, but it's going to have a little bit more variation in it. And so there, there's equipment, long staple spinning equipment that, that's set up to handle three inch fiber to four inch fiber with, with some variation. Some fibers are slipping in there that are five or six inches and, and you can deal with it. Whereas on a short staple system, if you have fibers that are much over two inches in length, then it's not going to be pretty. You know, there's going to be a lot, there are going to be a lot of defects in the yarn, unless you want to make a, a funky looking yarn on purpose, then it's, it's not going to be good. So um, you've got your long staple versus short staple. And um, we have both within our company and there aren't very many long staple spinners. It's, it's probably the, it's probably a factor of 
three to one or four to one short staple spinners versus long staple spinners, uh, particularly in this in this country. Um, and, and, and for our company, we can do both. We like to do the long staple uh, product because, as I mentioned, we've been doing wool all our lives. And so we've got a lot of wool spinning equipment. And so we said, boy, you know, this hemp starts so long. Uh, mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to preserve the length of that hemp and, and have something that could blend with wool? And how, how cool would that be to have hemp wool blend yarns? And so that's the dream. That's the dream that, that it would that, that we could get hemp that would work on the long staple uh, system. And, and most of the current hemp is, um, you know, it, it's sort of gearing, uh, it's, it's sort of falling more toward that shorter length mm -hmm. uh, due to the processing that's occurring. We've, we've seen some that's long, but most of it falls in that short staple category. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see the different forms of processing and how we're moving to the cottonized hemp to accommodate the cotton equipment. But in a lot of other countries, in fact, I just interviewed somebody last week, they do long fiber spinning. It's 100% hemp and it's six to eight inches. Yeah. Uh, you know, but the way that they're processing is obviously significantly different. I know they're wet redding and then uh, separating those fibers because the diameter of that fiber has got to be fairly small, I would assume, if they're, you know, six to eight inches long in order mm -hmm. to um, Competitive on the market, you know, for scalability, we talk global scalability. Some of the questions that have come up lately for me is, does the U.S. really have a shot at competing and bringing so much of the manufacturing back into our U.S. around the textile space? Um, you being in this, I'm curious what your feedback is for hemp compared to cotton and being able to compete with, say, China or some of these other markets that have a good I guess, stand or leg on on the processing side, right? Yeah, and the yeah. volume in which they're able to process. And, and, and that's a really good question. And um, what, what, I, what I found is if, if, it, if, if there's a product that is going to be um, hundreds of thousands of pounds per month, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're set and, 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 and there's, the, there's a huge demand for it, then um, the, uh, a lot of the, Far Eastern manufacturers and even some of the Eastern European manufacturers are going to beat the U.S. because mm -hmm. because you know for for to set up those big plants you need a lot of people and uh, and and their people are paid uh, a very very uh, low percentage of what our people are paid and then also in many cases they can get access to fiber. It's less expensive than than what it cost us to, to get here, mm -hmm. and so for the for the big stuff, the um, the the far eastern producers are going to set their sights on that. They can ship it here in container loads, and uh, and 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 that's the stuff where the U.S. is not going to be competitive. Where the U.S. tends to win is for um, value added and niche products mm -hmm. you know so if we're going to try to make something that is you know it's special we're not going to sell a million pounds of it over the year we might we might sell fifty thousand pounds a year and and somebody in the far east is going to say i'm not going to do that because you're not going to want fifty thousand pounds you're not going to want a year's worth at one time you're probably going to want five thousand pounds at a time or ten thousand pounds at a time we can't send a container load over that mm -hmm. right so they'd rather have it made. It, it makes more sense to do it locally because the logistics make more sense mm -hmm. and the logistics become costly doing it from far away. So, um, you know, so so that's where the U.S. manufacturers have um, uh, have have a leg up is is on on niche products. When you're talking about yarn and fabric. Uh, now, when we flip over to the nonwoven side. There's very little labor that's required in nonwovens. Okay, so the labor differential uh, doesn't it doesn't come into play, and the nonwoven products tend to be lighter, particularly if you're making something like insulation, right. which is re really fluffy, right. or you're making these pads that we're talking about. So you can't ship that very far. 
So that almost has to be made in in the United States. And and plus, there's opportunity for, you know, more volume. You know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, um, supplying insulation or supplying products for automobiles, that's going to take a whole lot more product than niche niche products going into socks or yeah. niche products going into beanies, you know, it's going to, so anyway, it, it, it all depends on the product. It all mm -hmm. depends on, um, you know, whether, uh, whether it's a commodity or whether it's, uh, um, you know, specialized. Oh, I think you nailed it. And this is really where the topic comes up. A lot of the conversations we have about developing cottonized hemp for spinners in the United States. I always just, I'm curious about brands and shelf space and where the, where that's going to come from. Where do you yeah. seeing from consumers or brands in the shift to hemp? You know, what are you hearing or what's the request? Uh, the requests are very vague. <laughs> uh, the requests are, we want something made out of hemp. Okay. Uh -huh. And we go, okay, cool. All right. And, and so, um, and so then we go, well, you know, does, does it have to be hundred percent? because at this point in time, it, it's been a bit of a challenge to spend hundred percent. And they go, no, no, it doesn't have to be hundred percent. We want a significant amount. And then, all right. So if it's not hundred percent, what do you want to blend it with? Well, we don't know, you know, maybe cotton, um, maybe wool, um, maybe recycled polyester. Um, you know, we want it to have, a, we want it to have a story. So, so I, I think, I think the brand and consumers, appreciate him because they've heard good things about it particularly uh, you know i think the sort of some of the things that have happened in in the cbd side of hemp where there have been some people who have used some cbd products and had and gotten benefits from that that's that's sort of put hemp back into a favorable position so mm -hmm. now they say well why can't i have clothes made out of it or why can't i have other things made out so i think people want hemp i just don't think they know exactly what they want. It's almost like saying, I want candy. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of candy do you want? Or uh, sugar. I, don't know, but or I, want sugar. I want something that tastes good, right? I want something that's sweet. But but you know, so so they want hemp, but they don't know what what really they want with the hemp. Well I heard you say something that you know like the brands are really looking for a story. And I think more and more that's something I hear on the consumer side and the industry being driven by the consumer, um, because especially our younger generations, they want to know where product is sourced, that it's ethically being made, that it's good for our environment. Um, right. I think that really opens up opportunity, especially for our entrepreneur mindsets here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I am curious. And I'm curious about volume. You know, what is a, what's a volume that's needed to compete with or to provide, you know, product for a, a big brand believe it or not it, it it's for for um specialty products the volume is not that big okay and you know and and so so let's let's just say that uh, there there's a an outdoor brand that's that decides they want to they want to make some hemp socks mm -hmm. and they and they want to have a, a cool story that is from from farm to 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 the shelf farm to shelf hemp and 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 they can track it the whole way and we know their their capabilities of tracking right and so so you can track it the whole way and um if they do a program like that then you know if it's huge it might be 50,000 pounds a year Oh yeah, and, and 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 so so you say okay, well you know that 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 could make a farm or two very happy, right? Mm -hmm. One or two farms very happy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make the whole. It's not going to make all the hemp grown in the United States. Uh, it's not going to suck that up. And then um, you know from from somebody like a spinner like us, a fifty thousand pound a year order is is fine. But it's not a mill runner, right. right? It's it's a it's a niche product that we're selling, and uh, you know we're you know it's 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 additive business, but it's not going to um, it's not going to pay the light bill every month. Totally, right? it's it's like you said, it's it's really almost still that small scale. 
But I think it puts into perspective what we need and what we're looking at for the production. You know, you had mentioned too that you get a lot of people, you'd mentioned this on a previous call, that you get a lot of people that will say, hey, I've got this fiber and I want to see if you can spin it. You know, what does that process look like is we have all these processors or, um, you know, manufacturers that are out there developing decorticating facilities and processing equipment. Um, you know, realistically, what is it that you need from them in order to run a sample or to test that sample? Well, uh, generally, it starts out with with them sending a, a small bag full of full of product, and 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 we'll look at it first of all, and and if it's um, you know, it, it uh, I'll typically. I'll typically take it and, and, and almost do like you do, like the cotton graders do. And the cotton, the cotton graders will grip the fiber and, the, and they'll hold it tight with one hand and they'll start and they'll start pulling it. And then you, and then you'll determine what your sort of your average length is. Right. Okay. And, and so, and so as you're pulling it like that, you know, um, if, 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 if when you, when you finally have the little, the, the little uh, bunch of fiber that's there, if if it's fairly consistent in length and it's over it, it's it's at least an inch that's good now if i start pulling it and all of a sudden there's all this <laughs> yeah. dust that falls out and the majority of the stuff is just falling down as dust and you look in the bag and there are all kinds of little chips of bark you go eh, I, I don't know that this is worth giving a shot because number one the bark can damage the the wire on our equipment where we're trying to straighten the fibers. We're, we're brushing it with wire, and when we damage the wire and have to re uh, you know reclothe our machines, uh, it's not cheap. And so n number one, we don't want to damage our machines, and then number two, we just want to have some consistency in that length to where when we're processing it, that we can keep all the fibers and or not all, but most of the fibers in the bundle, and we're not losing. Uh, most of the fibers along the way. So we'll look at that. And, and, you know, sometimes right off we'll say, no, nah, I, th I think, I think we need, th th this isn't going to work. Um, it, one other thing going back, the other thing that we'll look for are fibers that are stuck together, you wow. know? And, and so, so as we're pulling these fibers apart, if, if it looks like all of them are, you know, fairly fine and, and they're all fibers, that's good. But if we're pulling them apart and some of them are a big clump of yeah. fiber that looks like it's glued together, then in the degumming process, it didn't didn't work as well as it could have, right? Yeah. And so 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 that's going to cause a problem because that big clump is might take the space of 10 different fibers. And the way that we get strength in yarn is fiber to fiber interaction. And we need all 10 of those fibers to interact with the other 90 fibers or so that are in the bundle so that they can have the friction to provide the strength. And if you have if you have something in there that's that's long and, and heavy, it's yeah. not going to provide the friction to, to give you the strength of the yarn. Okay. All right, so, so we'll we, so we'll we'll look at that and get an assessment on the length and this and the dustiness and the trash. And, and it, if it passes that test, then. Um, you know, and we have a partner that is interested in, in looking at something. And we have a couple uh, hosiery partners or sock partners that, that are interested in developing something in hemp. So we'll say, do you need anything? And they'll say, yeah, make me a sample. Um, and so we'll make them a sample of something uh, out of that fiber. And, and then they'll, they'll take a look and see if it works. Uh, what? brands, you don't have to throw names out there. You've said socks a number of times, and I feel like that's something that's been pretty easy or what I've seen a lot of development on. Tell me what other specific items you're seeing. You know, are, are you getting in demand or requests maybe that hasn't been filled? So outside of mats or insulation, t-shirts, um, are you seeing anything unique that's coming well, up? Yeah, I think, I think hemp would, would work well in, um, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of hemp rope that yeah. was used uh, way back in the day, you mm -hmm. know, so somebody that could take, uh, take this and braid it into, into rope makes uh, a lot of sense. I do believe that, that, uh, hemp has a, a pretty good story for, uh, upholstery 
and and upholstery tends to be made out of uh, heavier yarns, and and um, and then I think hats could could work out well. I think t-shirts uh, could work well. In fact, uh, I have a hemp t-shirt that my my daughter gave me, and and uh, it, I like it. It, it's it's very comfortable and 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 what she told me and it 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 it, uh, it held true is she said dad she said this is going to get softer every time you wash it and uh, and so I said okay because at first it was a little bit rough and and sure enough it, it held true that it, with every washing it's gotten a little bit softer and and uh, and and I do enjoy it so um, the problem is. Um, with the inconsistency of the fiber right now, unless you only put 25% hemp in and you put the majority of another carrier fiber, it's difficult to get really, really fine yarns. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of these um, higher end t-shirts now uh, use a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty fine yarn, a pretty thin yarn. And, and, um, and, and what, the what the the outdoor brands would love if, if they could wave their magic wand and get it would be a hundred percent hemp made to this fine yarn count mm -hmm. and and um and that's the goal that's the mission impossible challenge that's out there and uh and and we're not quite there yet uh unless i you know i i do know of some people that have blended uh some some uh cotton at a high percentage with a low percentage of hemp, and they're able to get those those fine counts. That's not our game within our company because you know, that's high percentages of cotton, and we tend to be on the wool side. But yeah. um, um, you know, we have done some some hemp uh, products that are um, hemp wool products that that are over fifty percent uh, hemp, and uh, and and what ends up happening is the higher percentage you go on hemp the heavier the yarn's going to need to be because mm -hmm. the hemp fibers tend to be a little thicker. And that's why, that's why it's geared more toward upholstery because upholstery uses heavier yarns. Uh, the uh, socks uh, can use heavier yarns, you know, particularly if you're, you're going with uh, a thicker sock, but, but even with the thinner socks, um, the, the upper end yarn count's still not too fine. Um, and then, and then, like I said, rope uh, is always something that that, uh, that could make sense. So just think, sort of, um, anything, uh, home goods, anything that, that would take a little bit heavier yarn. Okay, how far are we away from hitting that as far as scalability? I mean, I see, like, like you said, that the highest grade fiber, the textile fiber, that's so small, has been the challenge. You know, the smallest diameter has been the challenge to produce at scale. But I don't see as big of a challenge on the thicker, you know, more coarse fiber yeah. that would be used for rope. And and what a big market. You hear about this all the time from the military. we yeah. military uniforms, right? They're a thicker, heavier Yeah, fabric. yeah. And yeah, and I, I think um I don't think we're we're terribly far away from 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 doing that. Um it, it might we might still need a little bit of another fiber instead of a hundred percent hemp we might need a little bit of uh maybe some some polyester in there and 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 in order to have a, a better environmental story that could be recycled by recycled polyester from from the uh from the plastic bottles right so you could do a, a recycled poly and and hemp blend with you know uh 50 50 or maybe even maybe even uh, 70 percent hemp 30 percent poly and I think you can make a heavier yarn that in, that is in braided into rope and and you, you go back to get the benefits that you used to get of, of hemp and rope and polyester is used a lot in ropes now so yeah. so that's not a stretch you know because right. right now it's 100 percent polyester or 100 percent nylon in a lot of the ropes so if you want just instead go ahead and go with hemp in there and, and get the benefits of, of hemp then then you could do it there. What about like um, tensile strength? I hear a lot of like, the ability to, I don't know if I'm using my terminology right. Wick. Is that where it is? Yeah. Right. Right. Is hemp better or comparable to wool? Where is it? You know, um, we're talking about two different things. First of all, you know, the tensile strength is really just 
uh, how strong it is. And, and what I've um, what I typically see and hear, and I don't have a ton of data on this, is it is it hemp is a little bit stronger than cotton. OK, just a little bit, a little bit stronger than cotton. Yeah. And okay. it's not going to be as strong as polyester or nylon. Okay. okay. Um, but, 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 but polyester and nylon don't uh, move water extremely right. well unless you, um, you do some sort of alteration. And there are some alterations that you can do with, chemi with chemistry to make polyester or nylon move water. Okay. And make it wick. Hemp naturally will wick. Cotton naturally will wick. Wool naturally will wick. And um, I don't know that you're going to find that hemp wicks more than wool or more than cotton, but it's going to wick. I think you're going to find it wicks like them. And and I and I could be wrong. It it, it might it might be able to um to to wick a little bit more than uh, cotton. I don't know the exact uh, numbers there, but 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 those are going to be wicking fibers and then polyester and, and nylon tend to be um, hydro what they call hydrophobic and uh, so they have a phobia of water so they don't so they don't uh, move water as well that's interesting I, I i just again i'm curious because the value of it for military uniforms you know you think about these uniforms over in these hot hot areas and they're covered up and yeah i, I was just curious and and same with mats yeah. You know, when we talk about the mats and its ability to. Well, and, and let's talk, you know, those military uniforms have cotton in them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that they, they'll have cotton and then they'll typically have a blend of cotton with nylon. And um, and uh, in order for hemp to get to the, the point where it can be competitive with cotton from an economic standpoint, there would have to be huge strides made because think about the 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 millions and millions of pounds of cotton that are produced and so there, there's an economy of scale there that that drives mm -hmm. down the manufacturing cost mm -hmm. of of that uh, to get it out of the field into the the spinning plant mm -hmm. and and i've i've talked to some hemp producers that can you know they're dreaming the dream that it can be competitive with cotton but it is, as of right, it's got a long way of to go scale wise in order to make that happen. And then you have a chicken or the egg phenomenon, right? Because are you going to scale it up enough to, to get it um, to get it that inexpensive, not knowing where all of it's going to go, you know, or how you're going to get it. it or well, how, it, yeah. It, like you said, this chicken and egg of, and it goes both sides from the buyer to the producer or the manufacturer or producer, and then from the farm to the production, right? Yeah. Or processing. And both, I think, are, you know, we, we can't bring an investor in to build a facility when we don't have anybody growing it. And then we can't bring the costs down without the infrastructure. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough situation to deal with at this point in time. So, so that, that's why you almost have to build, you sort of get your niche market first, right? Mm -hmm. And in your niche market, you prove that it can spin, you get people used to spinning it, you get people used to knitting it or weaving it or, or running it through yeah. non-wovens. And then once you, once you have that process going, then you can start scaling that process. But the first step, the first step is you've just got to find some sort of uh, supply chain mm -hmm. in order to in order to to get the kinks worked out mm -hmm. on the processing side and 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 get people learn how to spin it and make those modifications so that um, they're ready to go after the big stuff. Right, right. It looks like we had a couple of questions. I was going to see. Um, hello, sorry, I'm late. Could you please repeat the topic and legal about legalizing weed? Oh, we're not talking about legalizing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to highlight that. Um, so we're talking about textiles and spinning of hemp, or both wovens and non-wovens, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I 
it's been brought to my attention that in the like, automotive space for car panels and parts, the same fibers are being used um, like fiberglass, right? To replace the fiberglass. Um, in the past, what I've seen is a woven um, like piece of fabric that then is lined with a, almost like a plastic, right? To make the, or a, a mold of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know how to ask this question. What I'm wondering is the fiber itself, is there a way to utilize or merge those, both of those industries, or are they from the same industry because they're using the same, the same fibers? Like one is going to be a woven and then other not. It would, I imagine it just being the long, simple fibers. Um, well, I don't really know where I was going with that, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, one of the things that, that, that I'll mention is, is in the, in that space, you, um, there, not only in automotive, but for um, insulation of appliances, whether it be um, heat pumps or whether it be um, dishwashers or whether it be hot water heaters, they're, they're usually insulated panels around there and they've been fiberglass. And, and there's a, there's a group that is, is trying to, to combat that. And, and, and so, yeah, the, some of the products that they do will be maybe a, uh, a mat of recycled uh, cot cotton, like okay. recycled from clothes, yeah. and then and then they'll put a and then they'll put a fabric on top of that, and that fabric might be mm -hmm. a woven fabric, it or it might be a non woven, a different type of non woven that's just a a scrim, a really thin scrim. Yeah, and, and there there are types of non wovens that'll do that, and yeah, they'll put those two together, uh, and and you can laminate those two together. And, and whether, you know, that is recycled cotton in there, whether it's polyester or whether it's hemp or whether it's jute, uh, that the fibrous part of that insulated part could be just about anything. Right. And, um, and then you, you engineer it for your density and your thickness and, and also that, that other fabric that you, you laminate to it and you, you, you engineer all that to get the um, insulative or acoustic properties that you're looking for. Right. I'm, I'm just fascinated and I'm fascinated how the, you know, we talk a lot about collaboration and how industries are going to have to work together as we start utilizing every piece of this plant. Um, I'm curious about how this is going to mold or really fit together. You know? yeah. Well, I am too. And, and I've, I've, uh, that, that's why I'm, you know, staying plugged in. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, there, it, it's a, it's a really good fiber, but it's, you know, they're, they're challenges, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, we want to, we want to be there to be part of the solution. Uh, if, if a solution is, is desired. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what about putting dye? Do you know if, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the, um, antimicrobial properties and all of the benefits to the hemp um, fibers or textiles. But what effects do you know of that are, I guess, or how it, how is the fiber affected or the fabric affected when we're adding chemicals or dyes um, yeah, to the fabric itself? Does it maintain its antimicrobial factor or what are your thoughts? Um, usually fibers, and I don't know for sure because I, I haven't done the tests, but usually fibers that are that are inherently antimicrobial maintain that through dyeing. OK, um, uh, the, the, the antimicrobial products that don't maintain that over dyeing are, are typically topically treated antimicrobial. So you might have a, a, a fiber, a, a cotton or a polyester. Somebody can put an antimicrobial topical treatment over that and it'll work. But usually those go away mm -hmm. when it's washed or when it goes through water treatment. And sometimes it it goes away on the first one. Sometimes it can withstand 15 washings before it goes away. But those topical treatments uh, aren't typically permanent treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas a fiber that ha inherently mm -hmm. has it holds on to it for a long time. And then there are there are a few topical treatments that, that hold on to it for a long time too. Like there's some, 
silver and copper treatments that sort of get locked in and, mm -hmm. and, and aren't as, as apt to, to wash away. But, but the, it, theoretically, I would think that the antimicrobial characteristics of, of hemp would, would be maintained through a dying process. It's awesome. I'm yeah. I'm curious. I know there was a big discussion that came up about the the Chinese market and how they legalized it due to the antimicrobial factors. Yeah, so that was one of their reasons for doing so, and really bringing it back into military uniforms. Uh, what What do you need as a spinner and somebody who's really leading the charge when it comes to making the change? And you called it a bottleneck. I I call it a resource. <laughs> you, know, you guys really are are at this place to take the product to the next level. What do you need from the industry or from an organization like ours to really support support you in the growth and bring you product, I guess, or processed fiber that is spinnable? <laughs> well, well, first and foremost, you know, um, if there is, if there's somebody at the end of the chain, whether it be a brand or, you know, whether it be um, a consumer group that, that really, really wants it. You know, if there's a big brand that comes to comes to the textile industry and they say, we're going to make a million, a million pairs of socks next year out of hemp. Help us figure that out and we're going to buy it. OK, yeah. so then all of a sudden, if they say they're going to buy the socks, then the the sock manufacturer is is very motivated to figure out how to get that business. And they're going to make sure that the spinner is very motivated. And then the mm -hmm. spinner is going to is going to really get active about finding a processor that they can partner with. And mm -hmm. as of right now. It's is you know we're not we're we're interested but we're not we're not pushing the processors to do right. better and, and we're not saying boy if you did this we'll buy a hundred thousand pounds from you so nobody really has that that burning uh, motivation yet right where uh, do you think why why do you think because that's not what I hear and I'm sure a lot of it's because I'm in the industry and you get in your own bubble and start talking to people that enjoy the same things as you do. But why do you suppose that is? Where do you suppose that missing? I mean, is it just that brands haven't said, Hey, we're in and why haven't they said that? Or you know, where's that? It, there's a difference between saying we sure would like a hemp product. Right. Versus we're going to buy a million pairs of socks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. You, you know, so as soon <laughs> you know, as soon as they, put their money where their mouth is, right? Mm -hmm. Then then I, I think everybody is going to have a fire lit under them to to make this happen. And, and is it, when it's a nice to have, oh, it would be nice to have this. That's, that's a different sense of urgency than get me this product. I, mm -hmm. I want to buy it. You're holding me up. My, my, my process is standing because of you. Then we're motivated at that point. Right. Right. So, well, so you, really knew, you nailed it. And this is what I've said for a long time. In order to move a lot of this, we really need brands or consumer groups, like you said, to come in and say, here's the PO or here's the LOI. If specs are met, we're going to buy, we're going to move this right. along. Um, because I see and what I hear is we have the pieces of the supply chain. It's a matter of fine tuning so that your mill receives the right fiber. And, you know, then from there, your, your producer, sock producer, or your spinner, whoever, whoever takes it from that spot, right. Has the right product. Um, yeah. Well, I, I'd be eager to help. I'd be eager to help make connections. I'm excited to have you as a resource and your organization as a resource. How do people get in touch with you, Jim, if they needed to, or wanted to learn some more? Well, um, our, our um, nonwovens operation is called Carolina Nonwovens, mm -hmm. and uh, our website is uh, Carolina Nonwovens dot com, and um, and and their phone numbers on there where you can get to the people that are involved in in sales and operations, and then and then our spinning company is National Spinning, mm -hmm. and our uh, our website is uh, Natspin N A T S P I N dot com, 
And once again, there's contact information uh, on there um, as well. So, um, so you can you can uh, inquire to us, and and, um, and and we're and like I said, we're interested, and we'll we'll talk, and um, we'll take a look at the products, and we'll give feedback, and 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 t- but in, until really there's that pull mm-hmm. from from the far end. You know, we're we're really just in a, a development mode, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. and maybe doing a little teeny bit of production here and there, but um that's not what that's not what's gonna drive this thing. That what's gonna drive this thing is when when you finally have a big program. Absolutely. And, and I don't and, and and my crystal ball doesn't can't really tell me yet whether that's gonna be on the automotive on the um non-woven side or whether it's going to be on the traditional textile side and what industry is going to jump. But it, at some point in time, there's going to be somebody somewhere uh, at a brand or at an automotive uh, company that's going to say, we're going to be the first ones to mm-hmm. have a significant uh, hemp program in our line. And maybe they, you know, if, if it's a, a textile, traditional textile product, Maybe they they start that they don't start that within the U.S. and they start it uh, with a with an import product, uh, but uh, but maybe maybe the story really is the um, the field to the field to shelf uh, mm-hmm. situation and and they want that as part of the story too. Well, and again, I think that that's different business model, right? Than moving into say Walmart, but definitely along the sustainability and where I see a lot of the drive from the market coming is, you know, supporting our rural or or local communities and Mm -hmm. how cool to be able to, yeah, wear the clothes that were grown in your backyard. Right. It's a good story. Very good story. Well, I would love to make connections. I'd love to further this. One thing that I think we really need to focus on is a brands group, you know, um, bringing brands together to figure out what it is they need from operations just like yours or down the supply chain, but really pulling some more traction and information from the end of that supply chain. So yeah. I'd love to draw you into that and invite you to join. But yeah. we're already at about an hour and I'm off to Vegas here in a little while. So I'm mm-hmm. going to say goodbye for the day. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. Um, I'd love to have you back on. I'd love to continue this conversation and anything we can do, let me know. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, well, I appreciate your efforts to, to pull people together because uh, that's, that's when progress is made when we all work together. So thanks so much. And it's been my pleasure to talk to you today. And I hope you have a safe trip and, and a, a victorious trip to Las Vegas. It'll be our last. (laughs) I can't believe it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll send out invites. Anybody else that would like to join, you can find any information that you'd like about the association or upcoming meetings, the textile meeting where Jim is occasionally. I point the wrong direction, Um, but it's on Friday. So next Friday at two o'clock, one o'clock. See, Jim, I'm trying to keep you to miss it or make you miss it again. I I know it's time change or this time differential. I just, it throws me off. That's right. Well, thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening or rest of your day and we'll talk.